Well, good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study and a new week of studies. And uh, we're going to be looking at uh, 1 Samuel chapter 2. And this is uh, a continuation on the study, which I've entitled uh, The Kingdom of Israel. So this is, of course, uh, the pre the pre history to them having a king. Uh, today, we're going to at least look at Hannah's prayer. But before we begin, uh, and we pray together, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for this new week and a new day and a new opportunity uh, to fellowship, to get to know you and uh, for your, the light of your truth to shine upon us. We pray for one another. You know, Lord, the struggles that we face in this life, uh, that uh, they can be very, very difficult. Um, help us to rise above the worries and concerns of this world and to see things from your purview. So we pray for your spirit to speak to our hearts, to enlighten our minds, and to guide and direct in this study. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning again. Now, not everybody's here yet. I'm sure a few people will show up. Usually they do. Obviously, for some people, it's pretty early in the morning. If you live on uh, in British Columbia or on the West Coast of the U.S., and some people I know, they, they come to these studies uh, from different parts of the world as well. So, um, so it's nice that you're all here at this point. Now, we're going to look at Hannah's prayer. So, of course, just a quick review, you know. 1 Samuel chapter 1 uh, begins with uh, the story of um, Elkanah, who has two wives, and uh, Peninnah and Hannah. Peninnah, of course, has children. Hannah does not. Peninnah uh, mocks Hannah for not having children, and um, especially at the times when they go to Shiloh, to the sanctuary, to keep the feasts. And uh, we have at that time that uh, Elkanah shows favor to Hannah, which is what her name means. And that, of course, creates some jealousy between her and Peninnah. Now, she then, Hannah, is going to have this child, which she's going to name Samuel. And she's going to raise him uh, for a while until she weans him, and then she's going to lend him to the Lord. And so this prayer of Hannah is a prayer that she gives when uh, she dedicates Samuel to the service of the Lord. Now, with prayers like this in Scripture, how do we how do we understand these prayers? We've had, you know, songs or pray, prayers like the Song of Moses. How do we handle these types of, of and, and the song of Deborah? Now we have Hannah's prayer. How do we handle these? What what do we see these as? Well, there's an element in which they are prophetic. Okay, right. So they're they're prophecies, right? And and we could even go to uh, you know Jacob blessing his twelve sons. There's prophecies attached to that, and so in some ways, you know, Hannah and Deborah, you know, they're women who were, in a sense, prophets. They're going to be prophesying. So this isn't just a prayer that she gives, you know, thanking God. This is something that has prophetic significance. So we're going to read through this. I, I don't have extra notes for this yet. I don't think I don't think uh, Dwight sent me anything. You will have this in about two minutes. OK. But anyway, we, we will read through this first. And, and Hannah prayed and said, My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies, because I rejoice in thy salvation. There is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord 
is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken, and they that stumble, stumbled are girded with strength. They that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. The Lord killeth and maketh alive. He bringeth down to the grave and bringeth up. The Lord maketh poor and maketh rich. He bringeth low and lifteth up. He raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among the princes and to make them inherit the throne of, of glory for the pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. The adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Okay, so that's the end of the prayer itself. And then it says, And Elkanah went to Ramah to his house, and the child did minister unto the Lord before Eli the priest. So um, Angela notes this reminds her of she says, uh, Mary's song in Luke 1, verse 46 to 55. That's sometimes called, um, they have a name for it. The Catholics call it. Uh, the Magnificat. Magnificat, yeah. yeah. Um, I used to sing uh, a John Michael Talbot version of that. Me and my first wife, Levine, we would sing that as a duet in various churches. People would always have us go around and sing songs and that's one we used to sing okay so and, and it's a song of praise but uh there there are some similarities uh, to these two maybe we could even look at that one at some point here in analyzing this and and we see of course this contrast where god exalts those that are low basically is the idea of this song or prayer because uh, 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 with the Magnificat, the one that my soul proclaims the goodness of the Lord. My soul proclaims the goodness of the Lord. And my spirit exalts in my, thy salvation. Something like that. Where he's looked with... with um, or, Looked with something upon my lowliness, and my name sh for sh shall be forever exalted, or something like that. Anyway, um, so it's this idea that God e exalts those that are low and bases those that are high. This very uh, principle of of the gospel, right? That out of weakness we are made strong. Okay, so this this idea pervades the, this prayer. Okay, so let's take a look at some of this here. My heart rejoiceth in the Lord. Mine horn is exalted in the Lord. So what do we have here as, as symbols so far? Um, not much, but we have some. So when we look at horn, what is a horn? Well, normally it's related to like a power. Yeah, so it's related uh, to a power. And, and it's uh, Karen is the Hebrew. And the first time we have this word in scripture is Genesis 22, 13, right? Where he uh, says, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns, right? So it's going to be that same word. So it's, it's, it's often relates to a ram's horn, but it could relate to a goat's horn as well. Um, we don't see it anywhere else in Genesis, but we do see it in Exodus. And, and they're going to use it in regard to uh, the altars, right? Whether it's the, uh, the altar of incense or the altar of burnt offering, they're going to have horns upon them. It, it also is translated in Isaiah 5, 1 as a hill, right? So a hill is a type of horn. And mountains, of course, we know that uh, in Revelation 17, where it talks about uh, 
uh, we got heads that are going to be as mountains. So the woman that sitteth upon seven hills. Yeah, I'm just saying. Yeah, so you got hills or mountains or whatever. They're they're kind of like horns too. They're powers. So in this context, why does she say my horn is exalted in the Lord? My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thine salvation. And so these are some of these are a bit of idiomatic expressions in Hebrew. So the idea of my mouth is enlarged over mine enemies. Uh, uh, it's kind of a strange imagery there. Or family power or something like that. Okay, well, so the so how does a what is a mouth in scripture? Well, I'm thinking of speaking as 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 than making a law, but I'm thinking of her like being a, being a at last uh, a, a, a yeah, well, mother was was, oh. was quite an accomplishment, and she knew that only God could perform that. So she was prob probably was saying the Lord is going to give me a, a child. And, and and received a lot of mocking for it until they finally saw she was pregnant. After all these years, Hannah, you know? Yeah. Okay. Now, we know, of course, in Daniel, you know, that this uh, beast that has a mouth that speaks, this horn that has a mouth that speaks great things against God, right? So we have a horn that even has a mouth. So I, I don't quite know, the, you know, the fullness of this idiom, because obviously it's it's not literal right so it has some symbolism so the mouth to be enlarged or to be broadened so this would be uh, something to do with 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 having power over your enemies in some way but i'm not really sure exactly what it how that would be understood by by hannah would it not be more related to the praise to rejoicing that her mouth is enlarged, that she's able to, okay, in a sense, praise the Lord more. That that's possible too, right? Yeah. So that would be that she's exalted over her enemies in that sense, right? That um, that she can now speak, right? In in, it's not necessarily in uh, like in mocking or anything like that, but. Uh, Oh, what about her heart? That word there, my heart rejoices. Heart rejoices in the Lord, yeah. Well, yeah, so just part the of meaning, Just the meaning of it in Hebrew. Take a look at it. Uh, of what heart is or rejoicing? Yeah. Well, heart, heart is just the heart. Uh, I mean, it has to do with your feelings, your emotions, and and your will and your intellect. So it has lots of different aspects to it. Right, so it's very used very widely for the feelings, the will, even the intellect. Likewise, for the center of anything. Okay. Yeah. So, but but I also think in some ways that um, like the mouth being enlarged is in some ways it's like your reputation. Um, what's what's not just what you speak, but what is speak, speak spoken about you. That it's, it's sort of. Um, because your enemy's mouth um, can, you know, in this case, it's Penina uh, for Hannah. You know, she can say all these things. But now Hannah has something that she can say, that she can declare over her enemies, like her enemies have declared over her or her enemy. But in this case, she's using the plural. Okay, so now... What is Hannah typical of? What have we decided that Hannah is typical of? Just to keep that in mind. The class, the class of worshippers that are true worshippers of God. Okay, right. So, so we have the, the two classes, right? Um, that the everlasting gospel of affects. So, so we have to see in Hannah, God's people at the end of time. That, of course, they're going to be oppressed, but they will have this opportunity to overjoy. Um, now, Jacob has an interesting uh, idea. My heart rejoices in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. I smile at my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. Now, that's the new King James Version. So that is possible that the mouth being broadened 
could refer to smiling. I don't think that that's what it means, but it kind of does fit. I don't know that I've ever seen this used, but it could be in a sort of a poetic sense being used in that way. I'm going to switch to your Dwight sent me the chapter notes for this. Oops, I don't want to do it that way. Hang on. You got to download it first. You know what this is, this was though, because I was wondering if the horn as in the shofar might have been referred to. Yeah, well, it's not a shofar. This is a Karen, which is different, but. Okay. Right. Because the shofar is like a horn that you blow on where this Karen is. But I just think I can didn't work. Not sure why, but it's going to work now. So. So when she says I rejoice in thy salvation, she's speaking of Christ, right? Yeah, well, she would be speaking of salvation that comes from God. Okay, I'll read that right now. So, yeah, they don't give us an alternate translation here. And they're going to refer us to Mary's prayer in Luke chapter one, uh, just as Angela had pointed out. And that one says, and Mary said, my soul doth magnify the Lord and my spirit hath rejoiced in God, my Savior. For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth, all generations shall call me blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Now, as far as the horn, it says uh, Psalm 92, 10, But my horn shall exalt like the horn of a unicorn. I shall be anointed with fresh oil. Now, of course, it's not the, the mythical unicorn. It's just a one-horned animal, maybe like a rhinoceros or something like that. But fresh oil, what do we see in that uh, fresh oil? Right here, in this case, this horn. Spirit of God. Yeah. And now the idea of exalting a horn, like we know that they would store oil or pour oil from a horn uh, to be anointed. Um, Well, it's the priesthood then. Psalm 133, the sons of Aaron. mm -hmm. So... Yeah, so lots of references here that we can look at. Um, Psalm 9, verse 14, I will rejoice in thy salvation. Um, I've trusted in thy mercy. My heart shall rejoice in thy salvation. So a few references to that, rejoicing in salvation. So lots of different psalms. So God is definitely our salvation. Yeah, just as far as that, that idiom smiling i'm not really sure about yeah so jacob says alternate translation i found is power in footnotes yeah definitely looking at uh different translations can give us ideas and also using e-sword as a way of, of looking at the meanings of this but you know i'm trying to look at more of a symbolic meaning like what does this mean prophetically um, and that's why when I'm looking at the horn and the mouth, you know, what these symbolize in scripture. But something to keep in mind as we move on. Of course, there is none holy as the Lord, for there is none beside thee. Neither is there any rock like our God. So that this idea is echoed in many different scriptures, as we see in all these footnotes. Just hang on a sec. And we see that in 2 Samuel 22, 32. For who is a God, save the Lord, and who is a rock, save our God. I can think of other ones where dealing with a rock. Okay. So any more thoughts on these verses here? We see Hannah praying, rejoicing. God is giving her victory over her enemies. And she represents... Mm-hmm. God's people. Yeah, Kelly? Well, for the rock, I I think of the Jesus and Peter, and he says to Peter, upon this rock I will I will establish my church. Um and and how it, in the Greek it's thou art Petros, and upon this Petra 
I will establish my church and how rock and rock look the same. But when we look at it, Peter's the pebble and Jesus is the, the what, Petra, the large yeah. rock? Yeah. That's how yeah. he's neat. I like that. Yeah. When, when looking at the original languages, Petros mm -hmm. and Petra. Pebble. And you're, you're a stone, <laughs> like a small rock. Now, as far as the upon this rock shall I build my church, I mean, it, it, we can say it refers to Christ, but I think it also refers to the proclamation of who Christ is, right? It's it's his proclamation or the faith that he exercises in Christ that that the church is going to be built upon. Is my understanding of it, but in a sense, it is Christ that's the rock in this wall. In the Hebrew, what is the difference between this rock in 1 Samuel 2.2 2 and the stone that Jacob laid his head? Okay. Um, well, this is 6697, uh, sir. Um, now, this often refers to uh, properly a cliff, a sharp rock, uh, but generally a rock or boulder, which can also be a refuge, according to Brown's, our Strong's Concordance um, in Brown's Driver's Brakes. Uh, yeah, same idea. And then you're, you're saying in which verse? Well, I'm asking. Have... Here we have Samuel 2 2 in front of us. But yeah. in Genesis, when Jacob leaves and is on the run from Esau. Okay. He comes to a point where when okay. he... As his, he uses a stone as a pillow. Correct. Well, those are going to be Eben, right? I'm pretty sure. Genesis so, 28, 11. Yeah, so that's going to be... Um, yeah, so that's going to be Eben. Like in the word Ebenezer, stone of remembrance. Hebrew one one two nine. Uh for stone? For Eben. It's sixty-eight. Okay. Sorry, you're right. Yeah. It's from the root of one one two nine. Yes, it's from uh that word which is which would have a different starts with a different letter. Let me see that's uh Bana, which means to build. So I'm not sure. Oh, I guess the Ben, right? Bana and Eben. So it's something that a stone used for building. I guess that's the connection. Yeah, so it's a different different idea than between a rock and a stone. Okay. Yeah. Okay, so um, talk no more exceedingly, exceeding proudly. Let not arrogancy come out of your mouth. For the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. So let not arrogancy they use, they say the Hebrew word is hard, come out of your mouth. So would this be spoken to the enemies? Is that? Yes, I think so. And so we see here um, the contrast of the, out of the mouth of Hannah comes praise, out of the mouth of her enemies is Arrogancy, right? Speaking proudly. Now, of course, we can see here when we have the word exceedingly, exceeding proudly, it's just simply a word in Hebrew is doubled, right? Gabonha, uh, Gaboa, Gaboa, which means elevated, powerful, arrogant, haughty. And it's just 1364 is the number, and it's doubled. So that's why we get exceeding. Um, so God obviously judges. He's the one who weighs our actions. Okay. Now, okay, let's go back here. I just want to look at, uh, this is uh, some Spirit of Prophecy comments on uh, the first and second chapter of First Samuel. Um, she says, is recorded the prayer of a consecrated woman who served and glorified God, her offering of thanksgiving for the answer to her prayer is a lesson to those who today receive answers to their requests. Do we not neglect to return praise and thanksgiving to God for his loving kindness? 
God's goodness in hearing and answering prayer places us under a heavy obligation to express our thanksgiving for the favors bestowed on us. We should praise God much more than we do. The blessings received in answer to prayer should be promptly acknowledged. The record of them should be placed in our diary, that when we take the book in hand, we may remember the goodness of the Lord and praise his holy name. I think we read this quote before. Yes, we did. Yeah. And David declares, I love the Lord because he hath heard my voice and my supplications, because he hath inclined his ear unto me. Therefore, I will call upon him as long as I live. In the second chapter of 1 Samuel, is recorded a prayer of a consecrated woman who served and glorified God. She prayed, my heart rejoiceth in the Lord. My horn is exalted in the Lord. My mouth is enlarged over mine enemies because I rejoice in thy salvation. There's none holy as the Lord. There's none beside thee, neither is there any rock like unto our God. Hannah's offering of thanksgiving for the answer to her prayer is a lesson to those who today receive answers to their requests. Do we not neglect to return praise and thanksgiving to God for his loving kindness? So the same idea expressed there, which which we all agree with that. uh, uh, And that's the thing I always liked about Heidi. She would pray for things and always be thankful for God's answers to prayer, even for very little things, especially if we lost something or misplaced something. We'd pray, we'd find it, and then we would pray again, thanking God that we found it. So this is from manuscript 65, 1886. Was the exhibition before me that day of a character to lead me to have confidence that the Lord Jesus was abiding in her heart? Could I conclude that she was a person whose whole will was God's will? It was exactly the opposite. Of this, there is nothing in the face, in the deportment, that savored of the sanctification, sanctification of God, of soul, body, and spirit, of which God is the author. But every token was that of one bold, presumptuous, sinful, and defiant against the light of his word. Paul describes their condition. The natural heart is at enmity with God. It is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. Now, this false sanctification is eagerly grasped by all who hold their own ideas tenaciously for their own will to carry out their unsanctified wills under the pretense of doing God's will. God weighs motives, purposes, character. All men are weighed in the balances of the sanctuary. And God would have all realized this fact. Hannah said, the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. For Samuel 2.3. David hath said, men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Isaiah says, thou most upright, dost weigh the path of the just. All the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirits. Now, I kind of find this um, uh, interesting because when you think of a a weight, of a heavy weight, um, and and this balance where God is weighing, it's interesting that to be laid in the balance, referring to men of vanity, they are altogether lighter than vanity. So, so to be light is bad. To be heavy is good, right? In this context of how God weighs, how, how it's seen. And that makes sense in the sense that something that is heavy, like gold, would be valuable, right? So, interesting idea. The Lord has declared. What are the, what are the balances? What are the balances of the sanctuary? I'm not familiar. In the sanctuary, they would weigh things. I, I don't remember balances being in the sanctuary. Um, what's the one that uh, adds up to 2520 again in the sanctuary weights? Was uh, it the sanctuary weight? I'm not sure. I'm not familiar with that. Okay, I'll find it. I know there's measurements of the the temple and so forth, but I don't remember anything about rise and measure the temple. Oh, you're talking about in Ezekiel chapter forty when he's going to measure the city, and he has a reed like unto a rod that's going to be 126 inches in length. Perhaps I'm just. I thought there were some weights that also added up. Um, well, there's different things. That come, 
but yeah, I'm not, not. It'll, it'll come to me. Okay. The, the measurement, the, the uh, measurement around the sanctuary is 25, 20 inches. Yeah. Yeah. So we, we've had lots of different measurements. We, we went through Ezekiel's temple as well and looked at all the symbols in the measurements there, whether in cubits or in inches. Um, and of course, in Ezekiel's temple, because uh, the reed that he's going to use in Ezekiel 40, it's it's based on a, a, a cubit in a span. So it's a 21 inch cubit. So anyway. So yeah, there's lots of different symbols in the in the measurements that are done. The Lord hath declared that he will never leave thee nor forsake thee. When he revealed his character to Moses, he passed by before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. His eyes behold, his eyelids try, the children of men. The Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Of course, for Sam, the one that we had. I, the Lord, search the hearts. I try the reins, even to give every man according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings. The Lord has given simple, plain warnings to those who flatter themselves that he is not exact to punish the wrongdoers who live in daily transgression of his law. But his word is sure and steadfast. God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. He hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. We must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ. Let everyone that receiveth the things done in his body according to that he hath done, whether it be good or bad. In your dealing, uh, you have sacrificed Christian principles. The dealing with authors has been dishonest and supremely selfish. This has been presented again and again. God has been dishonored, and his law of ten holy principles, the transcript of his character, has been transgressed. The unseen witness behold, beheld all wrong methods and contrivances, and the secret underhand working his curse rests upon all such selfie, selfish, dishonest principles. When suffering under reproach, Hannah cried to the Lord, and the Lord heard her prayer and gave her a son. Then she declared the glory of the Lord, saying, The Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. Again, Isaiah said, Thou most upright, do weigh the path of the just. Solomon declares, All the ways of a man are in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirit. And David writes, men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are lie. To be weighed in the balances, they are altogether lighter than vanity. The motives that prompt us to action when men in responsibility are dealing with our brethren or with worldlings must be according to the word of God, for they are acting as God's representatives. Not one of your council meetings, not one of your board meetings, but was attended by angels of God who waited to impart wisdom and to cooperate with every principle sustained by the law of Jehovah. In his books, the Lord traced every motion made in these books, which his eye could discern as clearly as though there were no other interest in the world. He weighs every motive, every action. He has been grieved that his character has been misrepresented. A plan of working not at all according to Christ's plan has been followed. Men have been urged and induced by specious reasoning to agree to the terms of other men and to sell their rights and publications. Um, so here she's talking about men basically being defrauded. Uh, Shall the compassionate, self-sacrificing Savior find us wanting in tenderness, love, sympathy for those to, for whom he gave his life? God has granted us gracious opportunities for service. He has provided us with precious talents, and we are answerable to him for the use we make of them. If we use them wisely, God will call us laborers together with him. If we cleanse ourselves from every impure, selfish principle, we shall one day hear the benediction, well done, good and faithful servant. Under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, Hannah, 
the mother of Samuel said, the Lord is a God of knowledge, and by him actions are weighed. David says, men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether vanity. Isaiah declares, thou most upright dost weigh the path of the just. And Solomon writes, all the ways of a man are clean in his own eyes, but the Lord weigheth the spirit. There is not a motive in the heart that the Lord does not read. He reads every purpose, every thought. But those who would bring in fanciful ideas of God awake to their sense of their danger. This is too solemn a subject to be trifled with. So again, just more similar types of statements. God obviously uh, reads all of our thoughts, all of our intents. Okay, any thoughts on that? It would be a good idea to ask the Lord to purify our thoughts. I know mine need to be quite often. Yeah, so Kelly put up the uh, mini, mini Tikal Eupharsin. 126 shekels in uh, Daniel chapter 5, dealing with um, the fall of Babylon. So that's uh, October 13th, 539 BC, that uh, we're going to have um, that writing on the wall. So is that what you were referring to, the, the Kelly? That's what, uh, that is 2520 Giras. There's 20 gears to a shackle. Yeah, it, yeah, it's measured and weighed. Yeah, in the balance, and that's why I was thinking of a weight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Because in Daniel four, we have uh, Nebuchadnezzar seven times, and seven times being seven years, and that's symbolically 25, 20 days, and then, uh, then you have the fall of Babylon in the next chapter with Belshazzar. And again, you have this mini, which is 50 shekels, another mini, 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 right? So 100 shekels, a tekel, which is a shekel, and then a peres, or euphorsen, right? It's just a different form of the word. And that's half a mina, so that's 25 shekels. You have them together, it's 126 shekels. I should, I mean, I know you guys can look at it, but I should actually share it on the screen. So that uh, people watching the video can see it. So we can see that, right? Mini, mini, teco, uh, euphorsen is what it says. And then it gives, when he gives the measurement, mini, mini, teco, Perez. And then uh, you can see the 126 shekels. And it says in Exodus 30, 13, Leviticus 27, 27, Numbers 18, 16, and Ezekiel. 45 verse 12. So, yeah, so the one to Ezekiel 45 verse 12, also that ends up being one where we can take 60 shekels uh, to a mina or a mana, and, and you can get, instead of uh, 126 shekels, you can get 151 shekels out of this calculation. It's two different calculations. But this is the primary one. Um, especially from the Babylonian perspective, right? So there's 50 shekels to a mana or a mini. Well, I think you can also <clears throat> get it in Exodus. You can what? You can derive 50 shekels um, to a mana in the book of Exodus. Yes. Yeah. So so in the one in Ezekiel is a uh, just used by Ezekiel in the the new temple, the symbolic temple, he's going to use uh, a manna that's uh, 25, 20, and 15 different. Where is your farsen at? Let's see your farsen up there. That's Paris. Well, Paris is just, it's just the form of the word. Oh, so okay. Farsen is Paris, right? Um, Sounds like far. What, Angela? Farsi. Speaking of the Persians, well, it reminds me me, me of Farsi, and then you, then you're speaking of Persians. Yeah, yeah they, exactly. That's why they use that's it's actually a pun by using. Uh -huh. that. Yeah, yeah. So you picked up on that. Yeah. So it's because uh, Farsi is referring. That's the Hebrew for for um, the Persians. Right. Persia is, is more Greek word. And, and Achaemenid, the Achaemenid Empire, like 
That's again, another Greek one. Um, so lots of times the Greeks ended up naming things. And so we use the Greek names, but uh, this would be more a Persian way of looking at Persia, which would be Farsi. Okay, um, if I remember correctly. So, so that course is dealing with the ones that, uh, you know, that kingdom is given to the Medes and the Persians, right, divided. Okay, so the bows of the mighty are broken, and they that stumbled are girded with strength. And they that were, were full have hired out themselves for bread. They that were hungry ceased, so that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. Okay, so what about the bows of the mighty men? What kind of references do we have? Potentially Ishmael. Ishmael. So can you explain Ishmael and the bows of the mighty men? Ishmael was an archer. Okay. Right. So it refers to Islam as a symbol. Well, Psalm 127 too talks about God has arrows in the hands of a mighty man. So are are the children of of the youth. Look at Psalm 127.3. Okay. So again, it's it's the joy of having children. Yeah. If those children are going to grow up to be godly, that is. Otherwise, they're real pain. I'm experiencing that. Yeah. Um, Psalm 37, 15 says, Their sword shall enter into their own heart, and their bows shall be broken. So there we have bows being broken. The arms of the wicked shall be broken, referring to their military arms, not their their appendages. But the Lord upholdeth the righteous. There break he the arrows of the bow, the shield, the sword, and the battle. And the um, so those would all refer to these bows of the mighty men. And they that stumbled are girded with strength. So again, we see this contrast, right, between God uh, lifting up the meek or the lowly, right, those that have stumbled, and then the mighty are taken down. So we can see this contrast here that relates to uh, Penina and uh, Hannah. Any other thoughts on that? And again, you know, we're going through this kind of slowly, um, and we, we'll put it all together at some point once once we can make sense out of it all, of how to apply this. In 1 Samuel 2, verse 5, they that were full have hired out themselves for bread, and they that were hungry ceased. So that the barren hath borne seven, and she that hath many children is waxed feeble. Now, of course, in this case, you know, Hannah hasn't had seven children. But we can see seven as a symbol. So what exactly is this symbol here? And, and the word seven here is Sheba. That's the same one in uh, Leviticus 26 that's translated as uh, seven, seven times. Just the kernel number. So well, she does have children after Samuel, so we don't know exactly how many, but yeah, we don't know. I know she does have children later, but uh, but she's here and saying that the barren hath born seven, and uh, so so we can relate this to Leviticus twenty six is what I'm trying to say here. Does that seem reasonable? Yes, it does. Okay. Also, uh, Isaiah. Can't remember exactly what chapter it talks about the barren being more, having more children than those who um, have children. Yeah, so that's going to be in Isaiah 54. Isaiah 54, 1. Yeah. yeah, more are the children of the desolate, the children of the married wife, says the Lord. That's part of Isaiah 54. Yeah. Sing, O barren, thou that didst not bear, break forth into singing, and cry aloud, thou that didst not travail with child. For more of the children of the desolate than the children of the married wife, saith the Lord. Now, of course, we, we've talked about this, the idea that this birthright that comes through the firstborn and, and women looking to have the promised Messiah as their child, and that God has in his in how he has worked it's it's always going to be these that are that are humbled that he's going to exalt right and and in some ways that's typical of 
of Christ, because Christ, when he comes, he's not going to be born in some king's house with everything given to him. He's going to be born uh, to a poor, poor family. So, but we can take, say we have this, this seven here, and we, we can take that as a symbol. Um, yeah, just a thought, is Jehovah Samuel 2 verse 5, is it? Or... Yeah, it's 2 verse 5, where we talk to the barren hath born seven, or Samuel 2 verse 5, yeah. Do we just need the 20? So the 25, 20. <laughs> Yeah, well, you got the symbol, the numbers that come from 2520, yes, but uh, I don't know, it's a little bit stretching it, maybe, but but definitely this word seven, right? And now the other thing when we think about this um, in Leviticus 26, because this has to do with the blessings and curses, right? Leviticus 26 and Deuteronomy 28. And of course, we can see here that this this contrast of blessings and curses as well. It should take us to Deuteronomy 30, 19, I think it is. Yeah, that Deuteronomy 30, 19, I call heaven and earth to record this day against you that I have set before you life and death, blessing and cursing, therefore choose life, that both thou and thy seed may live. Okay, Second Samuel 2, verse 6, the Lord killeth and maketh alive, he bringeth down the, to the grave and bringeth up. And of course, we can see... Uh, this typifying Christ? Yeah, just you know, the, the resurrection of the, the, the first resurrection. Yeah, the resurrection as well. But Christ is, of course, the birth roots of them that's left. So we got uh, this idea of the resurrection, Christ's resurrection, and also the resurrection of the righteous. I mean, this kind of reminds me also of the Mount of Blessing, where we see, you know, blessed is him that is whatever bad thing and where he shall you know have whatever blessing right lord maketh poor and maketh rich he bringeth low and lifteth up so we get this continual contrast between being cast down and being lifted up he raiseth up the poor out of the dust and lifteth up the beggar from the dunghill to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of glory. The pillars of the earth are the Lord's and he hath set the world upon them. So we read some here. The Lord raiseth up the poor out of the dust to set them among princes and to make them inherit the throne of his glory. But the soul cannot be lifted up from this low position until he is found there. The pride of the human heart, God counts as a serious obstruction to his work. We are all in the school of Christ as learners. The life of Christ in the soul will be death to all selfishness. A selfish life in any who are educators is an evidence that they need to learn their lesson in the school of Christ. The natural tendencies of the human heart can amalgamate with the character of Christ. Cannot amalgamate with the character of Christ. The two are at variance. All flesh is as grass. The grass withereth, the flower fadeth, because the spirit of the Lord bloweth upon it. But the withered, dying, fleshly attributes cut the way to prepare, cut away to prepare the way. The Holy Spirit will be prized and defended upon. The heart will make room for the grace of Jesus Christ. The righteous shall flourish like a palm tree. He shall grow like a cedar in Lebanon. Those that he be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of our God. They shall bring forth fruit in an old age, uh, in old age, and they shall be fat and flourishing to show that the Lord is upright. He is my rock and there is no unrighteousness in him. Now, so when we think about uh, why God allows us to have to be in situations that that humble us, that are lowly, right? I mean, why is Hannah barren in the first place? Was well, this a test? Well, a, a test. Well, it's definitely a trial. Yes, it was. Well, I talked about earlier on that uh, Elkanah had married Penaya. Penaya was a lack of faith. Right. 
Yeah. So there there was sort of a test there to him that he failed. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That he was going to eventually bring a child through Anna, but he, he failed that test. Yeah, and we see it's similar with Abraham, right? Yes. Which, which produced, of course, Ishmael. So we see these patterns, these stories happening again and again. You know, and again, the critics of, they'll just say, oh, they're just boring these stories and rewriting them for different times. These are just a bunch of, of, of uh, literary tropes. But we see that this is the way that God operates. You know, God's dealings with men are ever the same. And, and we look at our own lives and we look at the disappointments we have, uh, the failures that we have, some which we, we recognize as our fault. Right? We can see the exact cause and effect. And some, you know, we, we seem to have no reason why these things have come upon us, right? We felt we were doing the right thing and yet uh, trials come. And of course, God is trying to lift us up. And it could be we're just depending upon ourselves. There's a lack of faith. It doesn't have to be some major uh, thing that we did that God is punishing us for. So so I think it's, it's uh, you know, it's just a, a, the reality is that we need to learn to depend upon God. And so trials are a way to help that to happen. God isn't, isn't mean. <laughs> in giving us trials. And and I can think of it, of course, having children. I could protect, protect my children from all harm. I could be an overly protective parent and, and not allow my, my children to suffer the consequences of their actions or to have to face difficulties. And of course, if we have a child that that is raised by a parent who is overly protective, make sure that that child's feelings never get hurt, that it never has any difficulty. What kind of child will she be uh, producing? A suspicious, distrustful, scared child. Yeah, it definitely won't have a strong character, right? The ch child won't be very, very resilient. Um, there are some who are, you know, speculate because of these broken homes where you have just a mother raising sons especially, that uh, those sons never learn confidence. Um, there's lots of skills that they don't learn because they're often overly protected, you know, especially like if they're just the only child. Because, <clears throat> you know, sometimes, of course, if you're a kid and you got a bunch of older brothers, you're, you're going to uh, have a different experience. Again, Kelly shared there just uh, rise and measure the temple of God in the altar. So different measurements. Okay. He will keep the feet of his saints and the wicked shall be silent in darkness for by strength shall no man prevail. Okay. What does it mean he, he will keep the feet of his saints? He can stop us from going off track if we decide we want to be guided by him moment by moment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, I think about that when I do backpacking. Of course, uh, you know, if I stumble or twist my ankle when I'm, you know, way back in the bush somewhere, I definitely wouldn't want to want to hurt my ankle. Of course, I have really strong ankles, but you know, God keeps our feet from stumbling, but He also keeps them on the right path as well. Right. So I fall almost every time I go go into the bush, but I haven't been really hurt. My legs, as I explained to people. Yeah, they look like they can flog, but not, there's no infection there, so I'm just letting them be. Yeah, okay. Kelly? We we were talking about the uh, heifer sliding back. I think, too, of I will heal their backslidings. And God, so yeah, God keeps our feet and returns our feet to the right path. He yeah. keeps our feet on the right path, yeah. Except I don't think that it's saying that they're sliding back, but the, the heifer's no, not sliding. No, not in. <laughs> not, but, not in. But, but just not, not here. I'm just thinking of it. Yeah, yeah. But, uh, About keeping our feet in the right path. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Keeping our feet in the right path to be led by God, 
Okay, what does it mean? The wicked shall be silent in darkness. They're going to be killed eventually. What's what's that? I didn't catch what you said. That God God will get rid of them. Okay, well, I'm not sure if that's what it means. It, it's definitely an idiomatic expression. Evil shall slay the wicked, and they that hate the righteous shall be desolate. I mean, eventually the Lord is going to clear the universe of all the wicked. And I'm not going to yeah. miss them one. Okay, so, okay, so this, you're, that's possible. It could refer to the final destruction of the wicked. Is that what you're saying? Yes, I have to admit it's a day I'm really looking forward to. Yeah, well, I'm not. But I, um, the way I look at this yeah. is with the path of the just, right, and, and, and the light of the midnight cry. You know, some people, they take their eye, uh, you know, they don't follow the light That's behind, and they fall off yeah. into the wicked world below. Kelly, do you have a thought? A couple. I just think of being in dark, in a dark cave, you know, you're, you're just struck dumb with darkness. And when I was thinking too, I was, I was praying for some enemies of mine that were giving me grief. And then I opened to the Psalms where it talks, I can't remember where it was exactly, Psalm 92 maybe, but when he goes into the sanctuary and he sees their end and and uh, that brought tears to my eyes actually I was I prayed more fervently for my enemies than before because I saw what God sees you know and why he has borne so long with me because sometimes I've I've ca callously said, I don't care anymore. I just want to die. Just let me die and uh, be done with me, God. And God doesn't let us go because he, he knows what we don't know. He can see eternity. And in our finite mind comprehension, we, we don't comprehend eternal life and what it is and, and what we would be giving up. And so, I'm with you with, when you say Theodore. I don't look forward to that day, and neither does God, because He's going to weep over the lost, weep, yeah. and and we should be able to weep with Him in, in that prayer for them. So yeah, I I understand being looking forward to evil and stuff being cleansed from this universe. We all do. But there's going to be a great loss on that day as well. Yeah. Now, the the thing that comes to mind, what you were talking about, um, um, with sort of understanding that God sees things that we don't. So I'm going to bring up flat earthers here. So one of the problems flat earthers have is that they don't realize how big the world is, right? That is, it's actually really difficult to comprehend large things. Right? Do people agree that, uh, like, how far away the moon is, yeah. or how how yeah. big the sun is? Like, you know, we have such a hard time comprehending such distances. Um, and <clears throat> hard time understanding eternity, like, to see things as God sees things. Right? That you know, where we can be so focused upon. The immediate circumstances that we are trapped in, let's say, and and not see that God God stands above all of that, and He He has purposes that we don't understand, and and to be able to trust Him in those purposes, that is, and and we trust Him as a child trusts a parent. We don't necessarily know everything. But we trust that the parent is taking care of us and knows. But for many people, they don't, you know, we get caught in what we see. We're like this uh, peevish children, you know, just we want what we want. And uh, what we want is not good for us. And if we could see things as God sees them, we would 
we would have. And that's why I said, you know, he's put eternity in their hearts. And that's what has to happen to us. Right? We need to see yeah, we things from God's perspective. Yeah, he has set eternity in the heart of man. Uh, that's also a desire to live forever. It's in the heart of it. Nobody wants, really wants to die, really. We all struggle and fight to live, you know, and we're sick with a fatal illness. We don't just, we can lay down on the mats and die, or we can get up and live. Okay. Uh, we, God puts that will in us to live. And when a person loses the will to live, they, they do die. Yeah. And and I like the way you've put it before, um, when praying about something, whether to do something or not, you know, make a decision. That that when God, when we're doing what God wants us to do, He doesn't really interfere with it. But when we're going along the path where it's not His will for us, it's usually something we don't want to do, and we have to surrender that, right? And that's how you yeah. say it. Yeah, and that makes so much sense. I'm just trying to, he has set eternity in the heart of mankind. That's Ecclesiastes 3, uh, verse 11. So I've never understood the one verse. One, that, you know, I'm pretty One sorry. of my most favorite books, one of my most favorite books, Ecclesiastes. Yeah. Yeah, I often do that as a beginning point in Bible studies with people who you know, struggling with the knowledge of God. Yeah, so in the King James, it says, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he hath set the world in their heart. Uh, but that word world is olam, which means eternity. Uh, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Now, so the way that I understand this is a little bit different, but... Uh, so what I, I don't think that it, to me, it's not about the will to live. I think that this, this has to do with, with, with really knowing God and his purposes. But it says he has set, we'll say, eternity in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Right. So God declares the end from the beginning. And that word, so that, Asher, um, uh, it, it could mean because, of course, because no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. So this, to me, is really about understanding God's purposes. That's the way I take this verse, Ecclesiastes 3.11. And, and, and it says, um, I have seen the travail which God hath ex exercised to the sons of man to be exercised in it. Right? That is, this word of exercised is kind of like basically to be disciplined, to be abased, uh, the idea of looking down or browbeating or to chasten. So when I look at, at these trials that we have um, and the trials of life in general, that, you know, he hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also, he has set eternity in their hearts that no man can find out. That is, because no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. So, so he has to show his purposes to us through the difficulties and trials that we face. In taking up our cross, yoking up with Christ. So when we look at, at this verse in 1 Samuel 2, verse 9, I mean, we kind of went a little astray from our path. But, you know, he will keep the feet of his saints. Um, you know, that statement in Spirit of Prophecy where she says that Christ knew the life of his trusting disciples would be like his, a series of uninterrupted victories, not seen to be such here, but recognized as such in the great hereafter. And we think about a path that we are on, each of us, in our lives. And, and we feel that we have stumbled, right? But God has lifted us up, and he has also kept our feet, Right? Those that stray off the path, the wicked, those that go into darkness, those that reject the light of the midnight cry and go off the path to the dark, wicked world below, they are trying to do so by their own strength, their own reasoning. Or it says, for by strength shall no man prevail. 
right? So this is not about us, you know, anybody being better than anyone else or knowing more or being smarter. God has shown that his way is to lift up those that trust and depend upon him. Any other thoughts on that? Amen. So, Just yeah, amen. Yeah, because we can rejoice in our trials. I mean, we need to, you know, be thankful for all of these things that have happened. Um, even the things that, you know, you know, we bear the blame. Uh, but God has, has been merciful in allowing us to continue. <clears throat> Um, so the next verse, we got about seven minutes. We should be able to get that one done. Well, there's a lot of statements here. Okay, maybe we'll read these here. He that walketh in darketh darkness knoweth not whither he goeth. So relating to the darkness there. When he thinks that he is at his journey's end, he may be far from his goal. Uh, he may find out that he has not taken up his cross and followed Jesus, the way, the truth, and the life. And therefore, he has missed the road. If you follow Jesus, your road is plain before you. You know where it leads. That is, that it is sure to bring you to the inherit, to the entrance of the mansions that Christ has gone to prepare for those that love him. Thousands traverse the broad road, but they walk in darkness and will never reach heaven. The path of self-denial and self-sacrifice is the only path that will bring us to the city of God. Straight is the gate, and narrow is the road that leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. All who find it step in the footprints of Christ. This is the way to eternal life, to heaven. He who follows this path is certain to find perfect joy in life, everlasting life. Although his onward course is sometimes difficult and often wearisome, let him move forward steadfastly, trusting as a little child in the loving guidance of him who keepeth the feet of his saints. 1 Samuel 2, verse 9. Let him have confidence and assurance, knowing that he will be kept from going astray. My son, the path has been plainly pointed out to you. Are you willing to walk in the light? Hear Christ's voice. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. Get rid of every pressing care. Do not again involve yourself in debt. This is Satan's snare for the ruin of your, of your soul. Many are unable to make definite plans for the future. Their life is unsettled. They cannot discern the outcome of affairs, and this often fills them with anxiety and unrest. Let us remember that the life of God's children in this world is a pilgrim life. We have not wisdom to plan our own lives. It is not for us to shape our future. By faith, Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. And he went out not knowing whither he went. Christ in his life on earth made no plans for himself. He accepted God's plans for him. And day by day, the Father unfolded his plans. So should we depend upon God, that our lives may be the simple outworking of his will. As we commit our ways to him, he will direct our steps. To many, in planning for a brilliant future, make an utter failure. Let God plan for you. As a little child, trust to the guidance of him who will keep the feet of his saints. God never leads his children otherwise than they would choose to be led if they could see the end from the beginning and discern the glory of or the purpose which they are fulfilling as co-workers with him. That's why I would say, you know, he sets eternity in their hearts. That's what I understand that to be, right? Trusting in God for what's going to happen. Uh, the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken in piece to pieces. Out of heaven shall he thunder upon them. The Lord shall judge the ends of the earth, and he shall give strength unto his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Now here, it says he shall uh, give strength unto his king. Now, well, who would that be? Does Israel have a king at this point? The horn yeah. of his anointed. Yeah, which would be, of course, uh, Mashiach. Messiah. 
what was that? What was that, uh, William? Was that you? William kind of broke up. Can't yeah, it was me. What you were saying. I what said it was say? Jesus. I said it was Jesus. Okay. Yeah, that comes to mind too. The anoint his anointed. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's interesting here. It's going to be mentioning the king in the context of obviously there's going to be a king. There's going to be Saul, which hasn't happened yet. And and we say that this this prayer is somewhat prophetic, right? That's the idea of this prayer. So the adversaries of the Lord shall be broken to pieces. We're going to have to look at some of this tomorrow. We'll pick it so, up here. Yeah, just in the Balaam's, one of his prophecies, he talks about the shout of a king was among them. So in mm -hmm. a sense, the Lord is the king there. Yeah. Yeah, so we'll come and look at this this verse. We didn't quite get finished here, but we'll look at this tomorrow. Okay. Any any final thoughts before we close with prayer? I still find I comfort in... One five, and, <clears throat> one, five, and six in, in the... In in a, in a revelation where it says that we're going to rule as kings and priests, I mean, if we're faithful, right? Yeah. Make it to heaven. Yeah, and also, you know, God uh, wishes uh, priests and a holy nation, so uh, a kingdom of priests. So you got kings and priests there together. Kelly, just to have the last word on Ecclesiastes and eternity in the heart, I still, yeah. I still find find comfort in the thought that. We want to live forever. Okay. Eternity it may not be in the original, but you know I've shared that with other people, and it and it makes sense to them that okay, no man really wills to die, but they want to live. We want to live forever. Yeah. See, I personally don't, so I would be willing to give up my eternal life so that somebody else. Well, can live. not, not, not. Yes, and I have actually prayed That's that. That's what you're prayer. saying now. Yes. No, I mean no, I, I have. Oh, wow. I have actually prayed. I have actually <laughs> prayed that prayer uh, of of Moses. Oh. You know, that to give give up my life I that I just it. might live. You know that that save them, just save them. If I yeah. if I'm not saved, that's fine. Mm -hmm. I just want people to to live. Yeah, yeah. I mean, well, I'm I obviously... have prayed that prayer in the past. But the more the that... evil of this world, the more I just want to say, Lord, sometimes I wish it's like that movie title, "Stop the World." I want to get off. Like I just am so I'm I have or the sin and the evil and the pain that these evil people are causing others. Yeah, it's just so Jesus says he he that I've had to put through it, even on his family and here. Okay. Well, Jesus says, "He that seeketh his life shall lose it, and he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it." Amen. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, let's close with prayer. Uh, dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we've had this morning, as we continue to look at your Word and to understand how these things apply to us today. We ask that you can lead and guide us in our personal study as well and that you can bring us together again to study your word according to thy will. We pray this. We ask for your angels' care over each one. In Jesus' name, amen.